Good afternoon all. Welcome to KTN Global Alliance um, Ideas Exchange event um, for today's session. My name is Sophie West and I'm the delivery lead for the KTN Global Alliance Africa project and I will be taking you through today's session. So welcome to everyone, welcome everyone to the panel session on blended finance for innovation. We're really hoping that this session will be highly interactive so very much looking forward to hearing from you all and your thoughts throughout the one and a half hour session that we have today. Just a few housekeeping points at first. For those of you not joining us on YouTube, please can we request that your microphone is muted whilst not speaking. If you would like to raise a point, please do raise your um, virtual hand or ask a question in the chat box. If you're joining us on YouTube today, please add any questions into the comment section below the video. My colleagues will be monitoring the chat section and will be feeding it back to the panellists and speakers for, for you. Finally, um, as noted in the registration link, this session is being recorded and will be used publicly. So firstly, I would like to thank the funders of the KTN Global Alliance Africa project. Um, so we received funding from the UK's foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO. We received funding from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in the UK through the Global Challenges Research um, Fund and also strategic support through our partner Innovate UK, the UK's innovation agency. We've organised this event in partnership with the Technology Innovation Agency in South Africa, Co-Creation Hub Nigeria, Simalong Gong Hub in South Africa, AFRI Labs and IHUB. So many thanks to our partners and funders. So first I'd like to introduce the KTN Global Alliance Africa project. So this is a six year project funded by the FCDO and BAYS, working in partnership to strengthen the innovation um, ecosystems and business environments in Kenya, Nigeria and South Africa. Over the last few months, as a result of COVID, we've been mapping the disruption to the innovation ecosystems in in Africa, as well as mapping the global innovation response as well. So as a result, we identified six key challenges um, that have been um, resulted from COVID-19, this being value chain disruption, constraints on funded funding, uncoordinated communities of practice, innovation governance, data access and connectivity and instruction. As a result, we've organized this Global Ideas Exchange series to share knowledge um, and learnings regarding the different responses. We really hope this will provide a platform for inclusive knowledge sharing. 
We like this to drive innovation through our Global Alliance and you, yourselves joining us as part of the journey for the Global Alliance. And most importantly, to look at building back stronger and together. So as an overview for today's session, um, we will receive some wonderful presentations um, from Franca Swani from Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance, Tamara Giltsoff, um, who's the director of the Assistive Tech Impact Fund, Wadi Awajori from GSMA, and Shruti uh, Chandrasekha from IFC. We'll then move into a panel discussion, which will be hosted by my colleague Emma Fadlin, and then I will bring the session to a close. Um, so just to highlight, the objectives of this session are to discuss, discuss amongst the panellists and yourselves as the audience how blended options could reduce risk and redistribute final resources more effectively and flexibly through innovation investment pipelines in Africa. So I'd first like to welcome uh, Dr. Franca Swani, the CEO of Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance. They are a network of social investors who will collaborate to increase the flow of capital into social investors across Africa and ensure that capital is deployed for maximum social impact. Frank presents extensive private and social sector experience. His previous roles include 14 years at Eli Lilly, where he worked in Kenya, England, Switzerland, and South Africa. His other stints included being VP and Director of Strategic Relations at the African Leadership Academy in Johannesburg and the African Regional Director with ARK, Absolute Return for Kids, and has also run his own consultancy and in innovation. So Frank, I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you, Sophie, and uh, thank you to KTN uh, and to my fellow panelists. Uh, real pleasure. Thank you for giving us the time to uh, be part of this uh, really critical conversation with regards to the direction that Africa will be taking going forward. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I always say that we are the generation that got the gift of a crisis and, and, and we should not waste it. Uh, COVID in many ways has come as a blessing in disguise to help us really relook at how we can uh, amend and fix the way we've been doing things and reorganize ourselves to deliver uh, better value across uh, not just the business, but the development sector as well. So uh, as at AVPA, we have uh, focused on trying to see how we can help social investors uh, become more impactful in what they do um, and fundamentally where we can uh, address the challenge of uh, them uh, attracting and deploying more capital into the continent. Uh, from a context perspective and a problem we're trying to solve, for those of you who are uh, using the SDGs as a framework, uh, Africa needs about half a billion dollars to $1.2 trillion annually to close its SDG financing gap. Um, that is uh, annually between now and 2030. Now, if you look at traditionally, our sources of capital have generally come from aid and uh, and government funding broadly. And aid to Africa is give or take $50 billion and government funding uh, based off tax collections in Africa is about half a billion dollars. So we, we have a huge deficit of about half a billion dollars uh, to, to close our gaps, um, our financing gap. So, uh, and on the, on the supply side, uh, you know, uh, capital to social investments from those two channels is also being affected dramatically uh, based on the fact that aid to Africa, especially if you look at it from a per capita aid perspective, is generally reducing uh, as more and more uh, African countries move into middle income status, but also as uh, more of our donor countries realize that they've got just as pressing needs at home and the taxpayers are demanding that they keep a bit of that money back home. And our government fundings uh, broadly in Africa, you know, our governments are running broke. Uh, that has been made worse by COVID. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, you know, we're, we're paying for a lot of infrastructure investments we made in the recent past. Uh, and you look at uh, our public debt to GDP uh, is rising across the continent. Um, for a country like South Africa, they had projected that get to the year at about 80% public debt to GDP. Now it's looking to hit about 105% public debt to GDP. So the government owes uh, 105 times the GDP of South Africa in, 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 in debt. So when, when you think about that, we need to ask ourselves, where are we going to get money to to uh, to uh, you know, invest in social investments uh, and in the process make the living conditions of, of Africans uh, better. 
and and this is, I think, this is why this conversation of blended finance becomes a really uh, interesting conversation. And and the COVID crisis, as I said again, uh, showed us a lot of opportunities uh, that we could uh, do a lot better of. So, for example, um, when when COVID struck, we created three communities of response in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, and within three weeks, we had about 400 organizations on those three platforms, and. Um, the, 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 the people on those platforms did some amazing work. So between March and September, we saw uh, an unprecedented collaboration in addressing everything from uh, food distribution to the disadvantaged uh, communities across major cities in Africa, uh, to providing education um, where Wi-Fi was not uh, available uh, in many of these places as well, uh, and solving a couple of the related problems uh, targeted mainly at the disadvantaged community. Uh, but at the same time, you couldn't help feel that there was a real need for us to take advantage of this to create real sustainable op options. Uh, so at a very basic level, when we started looking at, at uh, pulling together uh, people to look at the COVID thing, uh, we were shocked at how it's even just a problem to find uh, databases of, of social enterprises. It was not easy to find social enterprises with whom you could work. So we were asking people to wash their hands, but not every place had wash running water. And you couldn't find social enterprises that one, either had a solution to running water or two, had a substitute to running water to help people keep their hands clean from COVID infections. So it would have been so much easier for us to get capital to people like that if, if, that, if you know, those, those kind of that data was available. So, so and, and all these complaints we were seeing uh, are opportunities for innovation. Uh, so there is, for example, a really good opportunity for uh, some capital, especially grant capital, to coin, just creating databases of social investors on the continent uh, and social entrepreneurs who are doing that kind of uh, really good work uh, amongst our communities. Uh, and, and these kind of things that we spotted were many uh, along the way. Now, as we looked at, at the role of blended finance and the experience we saw, uh, it wasn't very obvious to us, broadly speaking, uh, at the emergency phase of what blended finance could do, but there's a very clear role uh, for, for blended finance in the recovery phase. Uh, and the recovery phase, as, and as, you, as you've seen in Africa, we've suffered more of an economic COVID crisis than a healthcare COVID crisis. And, and what we need is to see how we build back, uh, create jobs. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of this is especially we can support our SMEs to get back on their feet. Uh, that would be really phenomenal. So we've seen some really interesting uh, stuff happening. I, I think there's a lot of um, uh, stuff that could be done, for example. I think there's huge opportunities to support everything from uh, our incubators and accelerators. And that's where I think some grant capital coming in to, to support uh, those accelerators and, uh, and incubators, uh, one, not only uh, uh, pr produce the right type of, of businesses that would plug into the economies of today, but also uh, be able to provide some early stage, uh, rather the right investable pipeline for early stage uh, financiers. You know, we are always hearing the, the challenge of uh, that there's more capital than the investable opportunities of the continent. Uh, and, and that is something we need to look at how we can address with, the, with that uh, strengthening of, of, the, of the initial pipeline that we, we send through to our investor community. Uh, and then if you look at existing businesses, uh, I think we saw a lot of money being put into uh, stimuli packages, uh, and some of it went in as debt, as grants, and it, uh, you know, there'll be various uh, expectations of, of whether that will, will have one, uh, any repayment expectation or two follow-up capital to, uh, to, to keep this business afloat. Uh, and, and we've seen some really interesting stuff around uh, uh, some blended finance uh, instruments to support, uh, support some of those initiatives. So I have one of my investors who um, uh, decided to to, to put um, some of his grant capital in as convertible instruments um, to the businesses. So he, he lent them money, uh, he, he gave them grants, but uh, he, he had added incentive to them um, that should they survive, uh, the interest rates will be lower. Uh, and, and he then also put in some of his private capital at a much lower interest uh, along the way. So he, he was playing both uh, the grant provider and, and, the, and, the, and the, you know, market return provider in that case. Uh, and and I, I think there's a really good opportunity for uh, blended finance instruments to come into this place, into this space to support the resilience and recovery of a lot of our SME sector. 
Um, we at AVPA have just uh, completed two uh, facility platforms that we think will be of great interest to people who are looking to inject uh, more blended capital into the space. The first one is a deal share platform, which actually goes live in about a week. And the deal share platform uh, is there to support uh, social investors attract more capital either for growth scale uh, or, or replication of their models. Uh, and it's uh, the good thing about it is it we're able to connect them to capital right across the continuum from grant equity or debt. Uh, and we've seen quite a bit of grants come in to support small businesses on things like technical assistance. There's been a lot of money going into training. Uh, we've seen quite a number of our partners investing quite heavily in this downtime to capacitate uh, SMEs in their own capabilities so they can emerge stronger. Uh, and, and some of them have used that as a prerequisite to them giving them, uh, um, lending them money for survival and and, uh, and to address some of their cash needs. Um, so, so the second platform we're doing is a gender platform, which we're also going live with in the next couple of weeks, uh, next week actually. And uh, this gender platform will support three spaces, uh, health and safety, uh, economic empowerment and livelihood, and mainly, uh, and also gender lens investing, looking at especially where commercial capital is required to uh, access gender-led uh, businesses, women-led businesses, and SMEs. And also in the gender lens investing, we'll be looking at how we can play uh, in, in building up fun, female fund managers. Uh, and the whole idea about that is those communities of practice are there to, to support uh, very nuanced uh, areas of focus around the gender, gender space and gender lens investing. So we're, we're quite looking forward to that. And a uh, third thing we're going to be launching out very soon as well in the next week or so is a landscape mapping study on social investments in Africa. And we talk quite a bit about the opportunities in, in, in the blended finance space. Uh, now, I, I just want to put a disclaimer that we started this study in, in November before COVID. So some of the staff might be a bit misplaced because of the COVID crisis. But nonetheless, there's, there's, there's good stuff for us to be looking forward to. Uh, and I'll stop there for now. Thank you ever so much, Frank. That was really interesting to hear about the findings and learnings from the AVPA side. Um, just to add that, we I know you mentioned the, the upcoming launch of the two platforms. Um, for our viewers, we will put a link to the platforms in the chat as well for you, my colleagues, who will be doing that during the session. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Tamara Giltsoff, um, who's the director of the Assistive Tech Impact Fund. Tamara is an innovation leader and entrepreneur with a passion for driving growth and impact of technology ventures in emerging markets. As mentioned, she's currently the director of the Assistive Tech Impact Fund, with a mission to unlock the path to sustainable scale for assistive technologies for populations in Africa. Prior to this, she's worked in a number of advisory roles within EdTech, AgTech, FinTech and Digital Carbon Finance um, in Africa and was also Head of Innovation for the UK's Department for International Development, now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, um, in which she worked at the intersection of development funding and venture capital and oversaw, amongst many, the strategic growth of the £200 million multi-donor funded Global Innovation Fund. So Tamara, I'll hand the floor to you. My goodness, that was a long introduction. <laughs> uh, it's quite a mean feat um, following Frank in this, um, in this presentation. And I was just lucky enough to be um, uh, effectively um, taught by Frank in, a, in a, a course that I've just completed called um, Impact Investing in Africa, which is out of the Bertha Institute. And a whole chunk of the course was on innovative finance. So I'm just a bit of a plug to the course because it was really phenomenal. So if this is an interest area, I highly recommend um, that you look um, into that and um, follow the work of Oni Orton Power. Um, so thank you for the reference to uh, formerly known as DFID, now known as FCDO and my role there. Um, I thought I'd just provide a little bit of context before I talk about the AT Impact Fund. Um, um, and kind of, I think the context is useful because then you can sort of see the, where I'm heading with uh, the AT Impact Fund or where we're heading with the AT Impact Fund because it's really a collaboration. Um, uh, whilst at DFID, um, as you said, I was responsible for the Global Innovation Fund, um, but I also did a piece of work looking at um, DFID's entire commitment to innovation and um, impact funding 
um, which was a really a sort of strategic mapping exercise and, and review of where had um, quite considerable investment um, got us to. And what we know is that innovation funding is really an important area, uh, particularly in the super high risk early stage um, area. Um, but one of the big observations is that um, a lot of grant funding was um, going out the door without the, uh, um, without the same commitment to supporting the innovators on the ground and investing in um, those ecosystems as well. Um, and there's a bit of a gap there because if you don't um, provide the support that the particularly, again, the early stage entrepreneurs, but this can go quite far through uh, the stages of scale, uh, if you don't supply the support and the in really critically the ecosystem bits, the follow on in funding, the talent development, the um, entrepreneurial ecosystems to support um, entrepreneurs and innovators through this really challenging um, path um, to, to building a business. I've been an entrepreneur myself and a failed entrepreneur. It's really, really tricky. Um, so I was particularly looking at that and I was also looking at um, how could we use grant capital more catalytically in that way. So more productively, uh, potentially. So not just distributing grants, but using some of the grant capital to deploy venture building support and to specifically invest in ecosystems, but also looking at ways and exploring ways of using grant capital to catalyze other forms of investment as well which is in some respects a new and difficult area for a development organization. So the AT impact, roll forward, here I am um, uh, helping to set up the Assistive Technology um, Impact Fund, which is really a collaboration. Um, uh, it's a, it's a spin out from the Global Disability Innovation Hub and a program that sits within that called AT 2030, which is UK aid funded. We have 4 million initially to do an MVP of a, of a vehicle we have grant money at the moment, so we're not blending capital per se, but I'll talk to you about some of the things that we are doing and sort of heading in the direction of. So it's come out of the Global Disability Innovation Hub in partnership with an innovation group called Brink in the UK and myself within that mix as well. Um, and we're really responding to the fact that what we know with assistive technology and assistive technology is technology to design, uh, designed to meet the needs of uh, people with um, disabilities. So it could be hearing aids, eyeglasses, prosthetics, limbs, mobility solutions, walking sticks. Um, what we know is that really good product exists and the price of products really coming down and technology is, is really sort of disrupting um, traditional market ecosystems. But the business model for that product to get to low and middle income um, customers in some of the markets that we're looking at in Africa um, typically doesn't exist. Um, and so we needed to design a vehicle around, very specifically around those needs. This is not an early stage vehicle, but there is a bit of a blank canvas in terms of business models that can, can get these solutions to people. And there's a really strong intersection with things like um, financing and distribution um, uh, for assistive tech assistive tech we're also looking at the whole value chain so we're looking at things like the production innovative production and manufacturing of um, assistive technology hardware um, as well so if we move on to this is just a slide to show the website show that it is actually real <laughs> Um, so we designed the AT Impact Fund. It's a grant funded investment vehicle and scale studio. Our scale studio is the bit that sort of commits to quite um, a um, significant amount of venture building support. And we have brought in um, uh, a third um, partner to work with us on that called Catalyst Fund who are doing this in the, fit, in the FinTech sector as well and providing us with um, people that are on the continent, on the ground, know how to build businesses within that ecosystem and have, have done a sort of similar thing with us. Um, so we're providing grant capital and venture building support together, uh, custom venture building support. So that's the difference. We're not an accelerator. We're really taking this um, innovator by innovator to address a team uh, service needs, production, distribution and financing, because these are the known barriers to scale. So next slide, just to give you an indication of the size of the market, only 10% of people who need assistive technology in the world have access to it. That's about a billion people. Um, and a third of those abandon it as it does not meet their real needs. So there are some real issues around stigma, misuse, um, assistive technology breaking. There's some quite big sort of systemic barriers around um, this working well. Um, uh, and the AT providers are not really incentivized to get this product to low and middle income um, populations. 
Um, so there is, a, we believe that there's a space for innovation here. Um, and, and there's also um, the need as there is typically with a lot of um, tech sectors, but this one is really emerging. So the needs are really, really real. There's a real lack of access of capital. I'm not even gonna say access to capital. Most investors have never heard of assistive technology. Impact investors or philanthropic capital have never heard of this tech. So we've got to literally build this ecosystem from the start. Um, and innovators need access to this kind of global expertise on understanding assistive technology and lots of other needs as well. So um, next slide. Um, we sit within um, a kind of ecosystem of some other vehicles, including the GSMA who were running um, an innovation fund um, on assistive technology and something um, which is specifically relates to mobile um, and then Innovate Now, which is looking at much, much earlier stage product development stage. Um, and as I said, we're looking specifically at, at um, helping organizations to validate a path to scale, very focused on um, business model testing and validating business models. Next slide. Um, this is just to give you a bit of a flavor of the kind of investment areas that we are looking at, um, much of which I have talked to. Um, and just on to the next slide. <laughs> um, and this is the approach that we're, we're taking at a portfolio level. So as I've talked about existing AT solutions that are testing a business model for scale, something that we're calling adjacent to AT, we're not sure if these are investments themselves or that they're more partners. Um, so we see real overlap with the fintech, health tech, e-commerce um, and other um, sort of logistics business models as well. Um, Innovative manufacturing um, pivots into AT. So um, alongside this, we've been doing some work in, res in response to COVID uh, through Brink and, and UCL as well, looking at uh, distributed manufacturing and innovative forms of manufacturing, which is really, really relevant to assistive technology because these technologies are often really expensive because they have to be produced somewhere else and imported. But also often there's a component part that needs replacing. So new forms of, uh, of production are really important. And then finally, the fourth piece is really about working with corporates and SMEs that are say producing a product like a sanitary pad that could be producing a, an incontinence pad as example. That's just off the top of my head uh, because we've been looking at example of that. So sort of pivoting into AC. Next slide. Um, and then, yeah, this just um, this just kind of gives you uh, an overview of the proposition. But I thought I would just talk at some of the things that we are doing. And I had actually dropped in. I don't think you've got it in here. I had dropped in another slide, but it's probably gone in a little bit late. But um, we are, as I said, we're a brand new um, emerging sector. So we've got to um, bring investors along with us and sort of build the ecosystem almost from scratch. From scratch. Um, we are looking at a different, we're looking at a blend of business models that come into the, the fund. Some of them are for-profit business models. Some of them will really struggle to ever be a for-profit um, business model, will always need some type of philanthropic capital, but could be looking at a component of their model that could ultimately make it more sustainable. And there's been some surprises there, actually. So you've taken something that currently is 100% non-profit, but actually they, with their product that they're reaching lower income market, if they sold it to a higher income market in these markets or a middle income market, the model in itself could be uh, self-sustaining, which is super interesting. So we're going to need in the future to think about a different uh, blending, different types of capital in order to meet the needs of the different types of business models that we're getting into this sector. If you were sitting in a sector like FinTech, which has quite a large um, pipeline of, um, of activity, you probably would just take one slice of that and you wouldn't say, well, I, why am I gonna mix all of these different business models? We're in a very relatively niche area and it's an emerging um, uh, tech ecosystem. And, and then the needs are really real. You've seen this, the size of the opportunity. So we're gonna be taking in a different types of business models and blends of, of how they um, and of how they finance those models. Um, and, and then also, as I said, products exist, but the, the business models don't. So we know that quite a bit of support is needed. We are currently um, deploying up to 200K in um, grant capital, uh, but we're doing that and we're doing that over 12 months and we're doing that in tranches. Um, and within our tranches, we're looking at um, impact metrics as well as business KPIs. And we're really, really clear that this is the way that we're gonna work and we'll work very hands-on with the entrepreneurs. Um, alongside that, um, we will provide up to 90K in venture building support over a six month period for every single organization that we take 
um, into the vehicle. And in fact, that's one of our requirements at the very first stage of our investment um, process, that there needs to be a willingness and a need for us to provide that support to come into this um, vehicle. We'll also be providing quite a significant investment in building the ecosystem um, and ecosystem activities and a dedicated research component um, alongside that. So that's how we're, we're not exactly blending different types of finance, but we're utilizing finance in, in, in a very um, uh, different ways, certainly for the development sector historically. And we're setting this up in a way that in the future, we would like to take a blend um, of capital um, potentially into this vehicle so that we can use that sort of bespokeness that we're applying to the venture building support and, and also our grant agreements um, into um, uh, utilizing different types of um, finance to do that. So, uh, and we're really keen to attract different types of capital. We, it's probably unlikely at this early stage, but who knows that we will attract commercial capital. Uh, it is more likely that we'll attract impact uh, investment and philanthropic capital. And um, we are building something called a circle of investors. So we will be bringing investors along with us as we go through this process so that they can learn about this new ecosystem and see the types of innovations um, coming through this. Um, we're also going to be building a circle of partners because we know partners are really instrumental to this. So I'm going to stop there because um, I'm sure I've um, done my 10 minutes by, by now. I've actually been looking at the clock and um, we're, we're at the end of our, our slides. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Tamara. That was such an interesting presentation. And I really do hope the audience um, found it as interesting as I did. Once again, we will share the information about um, the AT Impact Fund as well on the chat so that you great information. Thank um, you. As Tamara mentioned, the AT Impact Fund is working in coordination as part of the wider, wider efforts with the GSMA Innovation Fund. So I think this is a perfect opportunity to bring in Wadi Orajori, um, who's the Market Engagement Director and co-acting head of Ecosystem Accelerator at GSMA. So Wade, I'll hand the floor to you. Thanks very much, Sophie. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be uh, with you all today, speaking with this great panel. Um, I really am in the company of um, some really great experts in this space, Tamara, who I know I've heard well from conversations around assistive tech. And I think she just uh, really explained very, very well how much effort and work is required to kind of build this new emerging ecosystem. And I think there are very many different players in this space, and we're really excited to see that space grow. I myself consider myself more of an enthusiast as opposed to an expert. So I'll sort of take you through um, how we work as the GSMA with a quick introduction on the GSMA and then how we're working in the development space. And the, our approach to sort of blended finance, which is um, not perhaps traditional, but um, has yielded some very interesting results. So on the next slide, I just very quickly speak to the GSMA, which is uh, uh, an industry association, which represents the interests of mobile operators globally and has done for over 30 years now. Um, and it also represents the interests of ecosystem players as well. And so in terms of in the mobile space that covers everything from um, technology such as the advent of 4G and 5G and to things that are more regulatory based such as Spectrum and everything that enables us to use the devices um, that we're all familiar with using in the networks. So we're very much in that helm of the private sector but within the GSMA there is um, our de mobile for development department which is on the next slide which for the last 10 years has had a very clear focus on um, ensuring and advancing and ensuring that no one is left behind and ensuring that the, the digital solutions that we, we all are familiar with um, are able to reach uh, people at the base of the pyramid. And so um, I think with the new advent of the SDGs, of course, that's given us something to hook this onto. But I think really our tagline there, as you see, is the driving innovation um, in digital technologies to reduce the inequalities in our world. And I think that's a very clear message. I think when we started, Mobile was, of course, where we where we looked at and looked at the number of subscriptions that there were. But as in, as you as you as we have reached the digital age that we're in, increasingly mobile is more digital, and I think that's where we have to really look at that. And I think that's why uh, assistive tech is such an interesting new space because it gives us so much uh, potential to reach people. Um, and within mobile for development, on the next slide, we have been supporting directly uh, innovators and startups for an innovation fund. 
Um, and this has been in a, a range of different uh, subjects and areas. So um, I've been privileged to work on a program which was called Mobile for Development Utilities, which looked at energy, water and sanitation. And perhaps in 2013, um, that sector and that space, particularly on energy and water, is probably where assisted tech is now. It was really nascent and, and very much emerging. And with the support of FCDO and, and other donors as well, um, that's, that sector, not just the startups in that space, but that sector has grown immensely. And there's been a lot of funding that's gone into the pay-as-you-go business models for those who are familiar with that. What you see here on the screen is actually an example of one of the funds that we've, we've worked on, which is on the Ecosystem Accelerator, which for the last four years has uh, had a very broad approach to innovation and looking at innovation, initially starting with the focus on um, shared economy and services for micro SMEs, and then taking a more sector agnostic approach and really looking at how do you support innovation and how do you build the ecosystem, right? How do you not just only focus on the startup, but how, what, what does it take, what does it require beyond just the funding to grow um, these sectors? And we've done a lot of work with tech hubs, accelerators, and of course the role of the mobile operator plays as, as, a, as a key partner, whether it's you know, helping the startups with their go-to-market strategy, whether it be in distribution or branding. And so we've seen a really important role that the mobile operator can play. So as you see here, this is a representation of the portfolio across Africa and the different sectors that, that, that we've worked in. And then on the next slide, the, the, the sort of impact of that, what we've seen is that that portfolio, um, in addition to the portfolio that you saw there in Africa, we also have a number of startups in Asia. Collectively, they've reached over 9 million beneficiaries um, and been able to crowd in in terms of follow-on funding uh, north of 190 million, so almost 200 million pounds in, 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 in follow-on funding. And that's been uh, facilitated through some partnerships as well with mobile operators that's helped validate the business model. And I think also giving those startups that opportunity to sort of core part, work with a corporate um, and really kind of ensure that their um, business model is suitable for growth. And if we dive into that 197 million in the next slide, you'll see now that breakdown there is 99% of that is commercial. That's, that's debt, that's equity. Um, that's been raised by quite a number of the startups. It's quite important that you see there on the left-hand side of that 197, over seven of the startups have been able to raise north of a million, which is a, which is a nice indication, which we use as an early indication of scale. It doesn't suggest that they have scale, but it's a sort of an indication that they're, you know, they've, They've proven the viability of their business model and has interest from, from investors. And I think if you see that as a multiplier from the amount of grant funding that's been awarded compared to also the funding that they received before they received the grant, then the, the funding vehicle that we've been able to provide, giving them that space, that catalytic funding for either 12 months to 15 months to 18 months has given them that opportunity. And often what we see in that time is of course, startup has the business model, they have a product, they have this technology that they believe um, will have a lot of impact. Um, and through the work with us and through the technical assistance that we provide, we also help them to be able to adapt their business model, to pivot where required, um, to also measure impact. And so we do a lot of work on our monitoring and evaluation and ensuring that uh, each of the startups and grantees that we work with have very clear ways to articulate um, the impact that they provide uh, and then also look at the sustainability of their of their business models and and if i go to, the, go to the next slide you'll see that that kind of result comes from the way in which we structured the fund so um, we do in terms of the fixed parameters that we look for when we set up a fund is they very much look at post revenue and for-profit um, startups that have a focus on uh, mobile or using mobile in some in some capacity and you see there what we offer them in terms of funding but also in terms of the support and technical assistance and then the bridging relationships with mobile operators but one thing i want to kind of draw out here and the variables that you see there on the right is really focus on that match funding component um, which we think is very important we think it's very important that the startups that we support um, as from our perspective we're using grant funding, equity-free, but we also want to ensure that there is um, some skin in the game that the startups have. 
So um, typically, actually, our fund was set up to require 50% match funding. So if a startup requested for 200,000, they would be, would be required to match fund up to 100,000. So the total project's cost would be 300,000 um, pounds. Given the COVID context and given some of the sectors, the models that we're looking at, for example, the assistive tech fund, we've recognized that there is a need to be a bit flexible there. So we've introduced the component of, of requiring a 25% match because we recognize that there are cash flow issues. We also recognize that some of the deal flows as well have slowed down in the current environment and space. And I think we also think the thing that we look at there within that match funding is, is that that match funding can be sometimes private um, capital, can also have some sort of private capital from VCs, but it could also be crowdfunding. It could also be um, in some parts, cash plus in-kind support. So whether they are able to provide sweat equity or access to, to software. And then this is where you get into the conversations around valuation. But I, I think, the, the point of this slide is to really kind of zoom in on that aspect of the match funding requirement and that skin in the game. And then actually that you realize that that match funding is somewhat dwarfed, if you will, by the follow-on funding that they're able to raise if successful, right? So that the 197 million that you saw on the previous slide is very much a, a representative of the portfolio. And I think by investing across a portfolio, you get the benefits of that. So some of the projects will succeed and some may fail, but from a development perspective, they all provide learnings and insights that are really interesting for us to be able to put back into the sector and help grow the sector. So I think from our perspective, of course, we want to see winners. I think that's more of the interest of the private sector, but from the, from the public sector perspective is, is how do we grow these ecosystems? Um, and then just if I may, in the last a few minutes or so, the next slide, just kind of draw to sort of um, some funds that we have currently uh, running across the, the next couple of years um, uh, with support from the from SCDO, but also with support from uh, other donors as well. So we have um, uh, BMZ, the German Development Bank, supporting our first round on digital inclusion by providing funding towards technical assistance and being very bespoke in looking at the specific needs of the portfolio that we'll be supporting there. The assistive tech round is actually currently open. So for those who are listening, if you're a startup currently watching, um, you have three days or so that you could still apply for the um, for that fund. And you see our ticket sizes range from um, between uh, 100,000 to 250,000 pounds. And a lot of those projects we expect to announce uh, in next year, June, 2021. And then we're scoping out three additional rounds. Um, but I think across all of the rounds, we've had to adjust. So even the digital inclusion round, which is really focused on mobile internet adoption um, and closing the, uh, the usage gap within African countries and in Asia, we also recognize the importance that COVID, that the significance of mobile connectivity in the COVID-19 world. I mean, I think if you look at the way in which we've been able to do business and continue to operate and communicate, like if, we, if we didn't have connectivity, then this pandemic and this crisis that we have um, could be worse um, than it currently is. And I think um, part of the resilience and some of the things that Frank mentioned as well uh, is, is down to be able, the ability for us to still be able to work and communicate and, and um, plan and strategize for sort of a better future and sort of working through this current climate. So those are a few of the funds that uh, may be of interest to those who are watching. And I'll finish on our last slide because I think this last slide really just kind of encapsulates the, the sort of ethos of, of, of mobile for development within GSMA and, and really perhaps fits within the context of this conversation where we really see ourselves as being the private sector and the donor community together. I think we've been able to build really strong relationships with many donors, um, as you see some of those listed at the bottom, and then also recognizing the role of the mobile operators that they play there. And I think one thing I would add here is that we've seen models where the mobile operators initially come in as, as a partner, perhaps providing technical assistance, access to APIs or mobile money integration, but later then become um, investors. So we've seen this in, in, in Kenya with uh, Safaricom investing in uh, a clean cooking through a company called Circle Gas, which acquired Copa Gas, which was a project that we had funded under the Innovation Fund. We also see it in Asia as well, um, opportunities where uh, uh, mobile operators decide to co-invest in, in a product or a solution. So 
I think, you know, that's kind of been our approach. I think we've seen some really good results and it'd be very interesting to kind of take this conversation forward in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roddy, um, for your time and also for sharing your, um, the pivots that um, GSM may have taken in light of, in light of COVID and some of the learnings that have come in. Once again, um, as well, they mentioned, there are a few days left um, to apply for the Assistive Tech Fund. And so we'll share the link um, in the chat um, should you be interested in applying for, for the funding. Um, so I'd like to next hand over to Shariti, Shariti Chandra Straker, um, who's the head um, of Startup um, Capitalist and SME Ventures at IFC. Shruti is an investment professional with over 30 years experience investing in private equity and venture capital. As mentioned, she's the current um, head of SME Ventures at IFC. Um, SME Ventures is a private equity investment program focused on providing access to capital for SMEs across frontier markets. Um, Shruti also leads um, IFC's gender focused initiatives across private equity and venture capital. Um, prior to her seven years at IFC, um, um, Shariti worked for Prem, Premji Invest and at Premji Invest, Shariti held multiple roles, including leading the global uh, fund investment program, late stage direct VC investing in the Silicon Valley and mid-market PE in India. So Shariti, I'll hand the floor to you. Sophie, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Shruti, and Sophie, you did an excellent job of pronouncing my name, even though you were not sure. It was perfect. Um, so I lead a couple of programs within uh, IFC's investment portfolio where we try to be as innovative as possible and where we try to, to do stuff in markets where other investors are more hesitant. So that's broadly sort of what I focus on, and I'll, I'll dive into it a little bit more. But in terms of sort of my presentation today, I'm gonna to structure it on three, uh, along three lines. First, I'll give you a little bit of an overview on IFC for those of you who are less familiar. Uh, then I'll speak about what we're doing in terms of innovation, uh, both in terms of technology and uh, you know, how we're supporting tech innovation, and, and second, also how we're supporting financial innovation. Um, and then the third piece I'll, I'll touch on is how we think about blended finance and what are the principles that guide us when we're thinking about blending uh, in terms of the investments that we make. Um, so uh, let me start with what IFC does. So IFC is part of the World Bank Group, and we are the part of the World Bank Group that works with the private sector. So, so we provide financing of different forms to companies of different sizes uh, in emerging markets across the world. We provide debt long-term debt financing, short-term working capital type financing, trade finance, uh, equity financing uh, in, in a whole host of forms. And uh, we, uh, we, we do this in varying check sizes. You know, some of IFC's investments are very large supporting very large scale projects. Uh, and then there are investments that we do that are small as a million dollars. So, so there's a wide range in, in what we do. Um, and uh, we are commercial investors, which is something that oftentimes get lost in the mix. We are commercial investors who are investing with a very strong focus on development impact. So we wouldn't do an investment unless we thought there was impact to be achieved uh, by the investment, but we're also looking for financial returns. So in essence, we're an impact investor who is seeking commercial returns. Um, and, um, and on an annual basis, we invest a sizable amount of money. The, the bulk of our investments tend to be debt, but we are also very active equity investors. The two programs that I manage are both 100% equity focused programs. Um, both the programs that I manage invest through intermediaries. So we would invest into funds in frontier markets that then support companies, whether they're startups or SMEs. So with SME Ventures, we're typically supporting funds in markets like Ethiopia, Congo, Kyrgyz Republic, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, Ghana, Nigeria, 
Um, and uh, we are supporting fund managers there so that they can then make very small investments, sizes that might not be viable for an organization as large as ours. Um, on the Startup Catalyst side, we're typically investing in small funds that are providing sort of the first institutional check into startups. So for example, um, we, uh, we're currently looking at investing in a $5 million fund in East Africa. That would uh, that would that would write you know seed and pre-seed investments into tech startups in East Africa. Um, so so that's broadly what I do. And uh, within uh, within our programs, what what we're trying to support the development goals that we're trying to achieve are, are broadly structured around the SDGs. So we have certain cross-cutting themes that we focus on, like gender. Uh, and then there are also specific tech themes that we look at. Uh, so for example, one of the, one of the areas that uh, has needed a lot of support and has seen a lot of activity uh, since the, the advent of the pandemic has been around logistics because people are moving around less. So how can you use technologies to optimize logistics, whether it's long haul logistics or you know, last mile logistics. And these are areas where technologies can make a huge difference. So a number of, of the, the startups that are in our portfolio, whether they're direct, direct investments um, that IFC has made or indirectly uh, exposed to through the funds that we have invested in, a lot of them focus on this space where um, they are solving problems related to logistics. Another area where we've seen uh, a sizable need for innovation, and I don't think we're fully there yet, but we're trying, is around education. With the pandemic, physical schools have closed, but students still need to be educated, and um, technologies, edu technologies, are, are trying to solve this problem in, in a meaningful manner. And across our portfolio, we've supported a number of technologies in the education space, right from you know um, uh, online programs that that support young children to uh, to vocational training uh, that can be provided um, when when a, when a person is fully employed at a company to upskill them. Um, uh, and the third area where we're seeing a lot of innovation uh, and that we're active to support is, of course, in health tech, uh, because the um, the activity that that we uh, saw in health tech has has been supercharged with the pandemic, whether it's telehealth or, you know, um, a remote uh, purchase of drugs, whether it is, you know, uh, access to uh, to primary care in a ma in regions that don't that are not as connected uh, in terms of data, but have access to a phone line or messaging. And so we're seeing a lot of innovation uh, in, in that space. Um, the other thing that we try and do with the IFC is think about how we work with these companies that have either a high level of tech risk or formation risk or early stage risk. Um, or are, you know, small, um, uh, you know, how do we get commercial investors to be able to, to consider investments in these type of companies? And how should they be thinking about, um, uh, about financing uh, in this space when they're still looking for commercial returns? And this is where blended finance has made uh, a huge headway. And the way we, um, we think about blended finance is, it is the use of concessional financing alongside commercial financing such that we can finance projects that otherwise might not have been able to be financed, mobilizing private sector resources or commercial resources towards SDGs. Um, and, and the way we think about this is broadly driven by five principles, right? And, and it's important to to think through the use of blended finance because what could happen if it's, it's not handled appropriately is you could have two pools of money competing for the same investment transaction, but coming from two very different places, which then distorts the market, right? So for example, um, if, if there is an investor who doesn't care about you know, certain aspects of return, 
because they have been protected by the use of concessional financing, they are more likely to take certain risks, which, which is a good thing. But then if there's another investor who's trying to be more commercial about it, they're automatically cut out of the process. And, and the last thing you wanna do is disincentivize commercial investors from investing. So, so a big part of what we're thinking about is how do we, how do we incorporate concessional resources without limiting the participation of commercial money. Uh, and, and so we think about it along five principles. The first one is, you know, what is the additionality that this money is providing that is, is needed? Like why, you know, what is the core need for using this money that the private sector would not be able to, to finance on its own? The second principle that we focus on is by using this concessional money, are we crowding in more funds? Uh, or are we just using concessional money because it exists, right? And the latter is not good. What you want to do is use concessional money so that you can pull in more commercial money so that you're increasing the overall flow of money to a particular market, to a particular project, right? So the second point that we're looking for is, is this money pulling in additional, uh, additional capital? And a, a, a sort of the other side of the same coin is that we also focus on is how concessional is this money? Is it so concessional that the uh, commercial investors don't care about the performance of the project, which again is not a good thing. What you wanna do is provide the minimum level of concessionality such that it, it just helps the, the, the commercial capital cross that hurdle of being able to invest in the project. The third principle that we focus on is commercial sustainability, right? So if we are pulling concessionality into this project, is it making it commercially viable? Or are we going to continually need to find concessional money to support the project? Uh, and if we need to con continuously find concessional money to support the project, then the project inherently is not sustainable. The fourth principle that we focus on is how is this uh, how is this project reinforcing the markets? Like, is what we're doing leading to the growth of the overall market? And is it addressing a temporary market failure that if addressed will lead to sort of a broader growth than just what the project is doing? Uh, and then the last thing that we're very particular on is promoting high standards so that we know when we're blending, we're, um, there's you know, strong corporate governance, that they're uh, complying with environmental and social guidelines, they're you know, ensuring that there's transparency, that there's a high level of integrity, you know, and, uh, and other aspects around uh, good governance. So that's broadly how we think about blended finance. And um, I'll, I'll provide one example that might add uh, a little bit of color. And, and, and so the, um, we were looking at an investment in frontier Francophone Africa. And in order for that project to be viable, they needed to raise a certain amount of money. And the, with commercial investors, they were just not able to get there, right? And so in that situation, we didn't provide any concessionality uh, in the use of uh, blended uh, money. But basically what we did is pulled in concessional funds to get the project to the right size so that you're setting it up to be successful. And it's not you know, starting with one arm tied behind its back. Another example uh, is we, um, we were looking at a project that um, was very keen on supporting women entrepreneurs. And we wanted to, to push them to do more than what they thought they could do. And, and so we, we structured the investment such that if they did achieve targets on the number of women entrepreneurs they financed, um, the, the fund inherently would, would get a better financial return from the investors in terms of sharing of profits than if they didn't achieve the target. Uh, and so there are different ways we think about it. We try to tie it to performance. Um, we, um, we, we oftentimes um, focus on understanding what is the core goal that we're trying to achieve from a development perspective and pulling in the concessional financing to enable uh, the project to achieve that goal. So I'll pause there. Hopefully I haven't taken too much time, uh, but happy to answer any more questions and dig in as much as needed. Thank you ever so much, Shruti. It's 
a fantastic presentation and really interesting to hear about the six principles um, as well that are applied by IFC. I can see a number of questions already coming in to, to the panel. So on that note, I'm going to kindly thank all speakers once again for your presentations. It's been a fantastic um, afternoon of presentations. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Emma Fradlin. Emma's a Knowledge Transfer Manager um, working in KTN's investment team and focused specifically on early stage investment. So Emma is now going to lead the panel Q&A session. So Emma, I will hand over to you. Um, thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists. There were some really great insights, um, particularly on the pros and cons and the challenges around blended finance for innovation. And it was really heartening to hear so much is being focused on as well around that early stage um, when there is a very high risk and you really do need that. In my opinion, you need a lot of blended finance. And before I go on to the Q&A in the, in, that's coming up in the chat box, um, I'd just like to start the session with a quick question on really how can we ensure that the blended finance mechanisms can be adapted to represent the needs of those that really they are really meant to support. Um, and I'd actually like to sort of um, invite each of the panelists just to maybe give um, a couple of bullet points about how they monitor or e expect their, their delivery channels to actually make that happen. So Frank, if you could um, maybe give us a bit of insight around, around that, how, how are you making sure that it's actually reaching the people that need it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so th thanks, Emma. I think I think the first thing is is uh, we need the investors to understand how to play in the blended finance space. You know, one of the biggest issues I see amongst our ecosystem of investors is that there's a lot of unconscious incompetence. People don't know what they don't know about blended finance, and uh, uh, and you find that there's there's huge need for uh, for education to our investors. So we we we, we set out to try and build a program. Uh, to improve the innovative finance capability of social investors in Africa. And when trying to look for an, uh, a partner to help us run this program, we're shocked that the whole continent of Africa has only one institution that has an innovative financing program. So if you don't use the University of Cape Town, you don't have any other option. So uh, the one thing I'd like to see is that we've got to build institutional capacity to promote blended finance on the continent. So, Shruti, from your perspective with um, managing fund of funds, what's been your, um, your instrument, your tool to make sure that those partners are actually targeting the right t companies and technologies? A, a number of things. I mean, we, you know, we are cognizant of the fact that as investors into funds, we are limited partners. And for legal liability reasons, we cannot uh, choose the investments. That, that's something that the, the fund manager does. But what we try and do at the start is try and codify as much as possible into the mandate of the fund. Uh, and so that the fund is focused from a strategic perspective on what they hope to achieve. And, and that those uh, goals are aligned with what IFC uh, hopes to achieve out of that investment. Thanks. And what about you, Ade? How about um, your, um, your partners? Yeah, no, I think Shruti um, said it pretty well. And actually, we follow a very similar approach um, with the funds that we, so recognizing the role that we play in, it's a very short um, sort of intervention that we play, right? So I think making sure that at that stage, the, the startups are sort of understand sort of the continuity and sustainability and what are those indicators, what are those metrics that are going to help them on that journey. And then also helping them to articulate that, and making sure that that comes out really clearly. So I think that's sort of the way in which we play our role in that space. So that's really good. So you've got both from the investor perspective, your partners, and also the companies that are onboarding. And then Tamara, I'm going to pass the question on to you and then also follow up with a question that's come up on the chat box for us. So how, how, with how you've structured it, what, what's been your um, sort of challenges and what are you expecting maybe from the, the people who are going to apply to your fund? Yeah, there's two different bits in that, I think. Um, and, um, you know, Frank's response is um, from the investor side. So, you know, at some point into both into our vehicle, but also the follow on investment for the companies that come through our vehicle, um, we want to be bringing um, those investors along with us and learning about blended finance is kind of one part of it. Learning about AT is a kind of ecosystem 
is um, another key part of it. So I think there is, it is a really new area still. There aren't, there is not that many, there's not that much evidence of this working really well, certainly within the kind of tech ecosystems. It's, it's been used quite a bit more in kind of climate finance. Um, so, um, so I think engaging, um, I think I talked about the idea of a circle of investors kind of engaging uh, investors on our journey and, um, and actually we need their input. So I think it'd be quite critical when we get to the point where we're supporting these innovators with follow-on investment. What are the types of capital? What are people willing to put on the table? And what would they be? What would they need in order to put money on the table to an investment um, in um, one of those uh, one of our um, portfolio companies? And then at a kind of fun level beyond the um, uh, four million that we have got, um, and we're really really lucky to have because we're in a position where. We we can learn over the next 18 months to two years, what do these companies actually need? Um, and as we go through that learning process, we, we're gonna also need to go out and start having those discussions um, with um, philanthropic and impact investors and maybe commercial investors about raising for a, for a future vehicle. I, does that answer your question? I'm not sure. It, it does, thank you. Um, so we have a question here around um, wanting to launch a company in Cameroon and what sort of support they can expect from the Assistive Technology Impact Fund. The question does appear to be around agri-tech. And of course, unless there is some linkage into assistive technology, it would be out of scope, I'm guessing. But maybe just talking a little bit about sort of the transboundary relationships and access to the funds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think, I mean, it may be that I also confuse things because I talked about the intersection with other sectors and we are sort of learning this um, ourselves. So we, we are a fund that is first and foremost about getting assistive technologies and assistive technology solutions, which are technologies to um, support people with um, disability, which could be eyesight, hearing, it could be mobility challenges. So that's our sort of primary goal to work on, um, work on business models that get those um, solutions to populations in key African regions. Um, that said, if, um, if there's an agri-tech business or an agri-business that is reaching multiple um, uh, farmers um, or um, individuals along the kind of value chain of, of agriculture um, and that there is a clear path to distributing and financing of assistive technology for those um, uh, individuals, then that is super interesting to us. It, that, that organization would need to come together with an assistive technology provider, obviously, because um, that, you know, that's what we are doing. We're getting assistive tech to organizations. And I think agriculture is a, a super interesting area for us to be um, exploring. But um, yeah, I hope, I hope that's clear. I suppose there could also be enabling technologies to allow people to expand into different sort of areas of work and therefore prosperity, particularly in rural economies. So yeah. that, would be, that would be a good target as well for blending in sort of a, an agri model along with um, disability or, uh, abilities <laughs> and then improve yeah. ability to a participate. What we know in the agri sector is that there is quite a lot around um, financing for input, um, for agricultural inputs as example, or um, you know, different types of financing. We are interested in, um, you know, can you extend that, that type of financing to distribute and finance an AT product and sort of build on that existing uh, distribution model. So that's where we call it adjacent to AT. We're still really exploring it. We're not sure that we could just directly invest in an agribusiness or a fintech in agribusiness with no um, partnership in place with an AT um, partner, but we, we are really, really interested. And we do have, um, uh, unlike the Juice May, we're not doing a sort of closed call on this. We have an open window, um, but we encourage people that are interested to get in touch with us and have some conversations because uh, it goes back to the kind of, we don't know what we don't know. We are a really new um, sector. So often we need to kind of talk through and explore this with uh, potential innovators. Um, and that segues really nicely into another question that we've had, which is around the business model validation. And the question is basically the business model validation needs to be a key prerequisite to set up a good business project. Then what instruments someone can rely on to ensure his business model is competitive? Um, I would possibly um, like to pass that on to Wade, first of all, about how you work with the accelerators on actually bringing together the right partnerships so that you do have a, a scalable business. Um, could you 
maybe give a bit of insight about how you work? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I think what way we work and the way we sort of um, so tomorrow talked about sort of this closed uh, window that we have with the opportunity for startups to apply for funding with us. And I think what we look at quite extensively with the sort of the pitch and um, that the, the startups put forward is to really, depending on those that meet our criteria, to really go in depth and really understand um, who are the key kind of uh, partners that they need to work with and stakeholders to that, to that project. Um, it's, it's, it's true that for the GSMA, we do see mobile operators can play a role, but it's also trying to understand what role that is. So the, is the role of the mobile operator there to be um, a way to help you access more of the market? Um, and if so, what is the value proposition for that mobile operator and, and, and how is there a sort of a, a mutual gain? So recognizing the needs and the hands of the startups and also the needs in the hands of a mobile operator. And then beyond that, so looking, depending on the, depending on the spaces, then looking at um, who, you know, who else do you need to engage with? Um, I think that that's one of the things is that for us to be able to understand the validation is this, okay, how well do you, do you know your, your, your market, your customer, how have you determined the sort of willingness and the ability to pay? Um, how are you in, so, so, so we really go into depth to sort of explore all of that um, during our selection process. So I think to sort of that validation is, is that we want to be able to see that there is some traction. You do have some um, users, um, not just registered users, but how many are active, you know, what's the addressable market there and what's that potential. And then, you know, depending on the other criteria and how we compare with other models, we then would work with you to sort of grow that and look at what, what, what is your path to sustainability. So I hope that answers the question. Um, Frank, um, you brought up how important it was to build up incubators and accelerators. And would you like to maybe sort of talk a little bit about how bringing in sort of the end users, the beneficiaries, such as the corporates into those models is really important to, to help build that sustainable business model. Um, what your recommendations are around that? Yeah, I, the, the, there's, there's various ways all the uh, diverse set of stakeholders could play a role in strengthening that early stage support system. I think your, your philanthropist could help with uh, a lot of your uh, grant capital to strengthen those uh, those uh, incubators and accelerators, but also to facilitate the connection between the incubators and accelerators and the follow-on capital providers. Because part of the challenge we have is, uh, is the lack of connection or understanding of what uh, the follow-on investors are looking for in, in, the, in the right deal flow. And if that communication is not happening, uh, we, we, we find that uh, the products coming out of the uh, of the, of the accelerators and incubators are not suitable to what the investors are looking for. So, so there's that particular thing. And then uh, I think your corporates could play a, a bigger role downstream and being very deliberate, for example, in plugging some of these uh, early stage uh, businesses into the supply chains. Um, and we, we've seen some doing a, a really good job of that uh, where they've deliberately uh, supported women-led businesses, for example, uh, and plug them into the supply chain. So, so there's multiple ways in which I think we can all uh, play a role in this. Now, the other thing not to forget that it's not always about money. Uh, there's also a lot of non-financial support required. And, and, and that is also something that we should never forget. Uh, uh, you know, our early stage businesses need uh, to get them to where they should be. And, and the handholding and mentorship is also very, very important. So the, 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 there's places, I think, for many of us uh, as key stakeholders in this ecosystem to support the growth of, of the, that pipeline. Yeah, my recommendation for Alexandre is it's really important to find some mentors who can help you not only in your technology, but in your commercialization model to, to help you build that model and also sense check it with end users or the end beneficiaries. And that's where the accelerators are very powerful places yeah. you make. If um, I may go that, um, Emma, just for two points I'd like to add, I think I think that uh, Frank makes some really great, great points, and I think that from our experience in the GSMA, we've seen opportunities where we, we do annual boot camps and that opportunity to invite investors to have the conversations um, with the startups to also have um, through a lot of our partners around like companies like Matchmaker Ventures to provide opportunities to understand how you can co up and really build that. Uh, relationship with corporates um, and then I think if you're working with a mobile operator within our space as well is that you know identifying champions um, within those um, large organizations that can really um, advocate for you you know internally to sort of help 
prove or, or get the sort of support from senior management to help push your business further. I, I think that those are some of the things that we've been able to see as well. No, thank you. That's um, really valuable. Um, very but unwise words there. So we have another question around, um, and it's, it's quite an interesting one. So I'm not sure who would be would like to lead on answering this, but technology in terms of telecoms and software is an easy sell in Africa. But what's actually happening around the domain of life sciences, diagnostics and manufacturing, which are not as developed as um, sectors as in the West. And um, I, maybe I can start with Frank around sort of what you're seeing around supporting SMEs and the different mechanisms and job creation that comes from this as well. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. Uh, actually, we are talking to a group of investors at the moment to help set up a primary healthcare fund. Uh, for the continent because there isn't one on the continent uh, and part of what it wants to, the fund wants to try and do is to uh, support the tech development for that particular space and this is kind of uh, uh, the, the micro tech space where we, 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 we take some of the big um, let's say diagnostic equipment and make it into small uh, enough uh, tools that can be used at a primary care, very grassroots level. Uh, so, so we're recognizing that there, there is uh, there's huge opportunities, and, and a lot of this funding, by the way, is not coming in as grant capital. It's coming in as as capital that is seeking a sustainable market-based solutions, uh, which are in the context of, in many cases, social enterprises. So they'll give low-cost solutions to a lot of broad-based uh, grassroots, uh, uh, you know, market. And so, 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 so there's, there's huge interest in that. Uh, we're seeing that in the healthcare space, we're seeing that in the agricultural space, uh, and increasingly more and more fund, funds uh, are coming to us to see how we can support creating those kind of opportunities in Africa. I've got, a, I've got another uh, consortium that we're working on that is looking to do a $100 million fund for early stage invest, investments um, across the continent uh, that's sector agnostic. Uh, and healthcare is one thing they want to look at as well. So, so they, they, there's emerging interest in, in these spaces broadly. Um, and maybe, um, Shruti, is there anything that you're seeing from the fund of funds that you're engaged with? Sure. Uh, am I happy, happy to answer that? So we are starting to see activity in life sciences as well as uh, activity in manufacturing. And it's a little bit different. Uh, so, for example, um, genomics is a space where we're starting to see startups that now have raised, you know, close to six, seven million dollars that are that have come out of markets like Nigeria that are focusing around the fact that data on the, uh, of, you know, the, the DNA database of um, African DNA is just very small for the entire world. And, and it's something that needs investment and needs growth. And we're starting to see sort of more advanced solutions coming out of Africa, as opposed to just copycat solutions of, of models that exist uh, in the West. On manufacturing, there have been a few interesting ideas that have started to emerge. One um, uh, concept that a number of different startups are exploring is distributed manufacturing. So using technology to, to manage the process, but not manufacturing and how we think of it as an assembly line, but using localized workforces that are uh, uh, disparately located uh, to be able to, to manufacture different parts and then pulling together in a final combining facility. So, so we're starting to see people think about solutions that are uniquely solutions for Africa, as opposed to you know, a, a, a way of doing business that exists in a different market that's being replicated here. Um, the other thing that we also saw in, in terms of on the manufacturing side um, is uh, improvement in logistics. So for, for most manufacturing business, in businesses, eight to 10% of their PL is, is spent on logistics. And so we're starting to see a lot of improvement uh, using technology and logistics, which directly improves the bottom line for, uh, for manufacturing companies. And my final point is what we saw um, in, in terms of innovative thinking in response to the pandemic was manufacturing companies um, repurposing their manufacturing lines for solutions that, that were needed for COVID, for example, you know, we saw a, a perfume factory, uh, which is, you know, a, a small SME 
change their um, um, their assembly lines to produce sanitizer uh, to to address the, the 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 need for the growing need for sanitizer uh, in today's times. So we have seen changes even in sectors like manufacturing and life sciences uh, where technology has made a difference. Thank you. Um, we have another question, which is quite niche, but it's a very interesting question because I think it might fit in with the telephony. Um, and this is what are the opportunities for um, or is there an opportunity for education technology um, to really pick up the challenges around special educational needs and autism learning and to tap into the infrastructure that we have in Africa? So I don't know whether it's something that, um, what do you have any insights in from the um, education perspective? Um, not, not, not any specific uh, case studies that, that come to mind in the context of, um, of, of Africa. I was just thinking as I was listening to that question around generating technology, there's, there's uh, quite a few things in terms of on the frontier side looking at the role in which uh, AI could play or virtual reality and, 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 and that aspect. But I don't have any direct examples that I, I could speak to. I definitely think it's an opportunity just because I'm a technology enthusiast, right? So with that, you know, a lot of what I've seen, um, depending on regardless of what, in any sector, we've been able to see uh, business models. I think what would be most important for any sector, particularly education, is the support you know, to not just the technology itself, but the business model and how do you support its adoption? And I think that's perhaps the kind of interesting thing if I was to just play back that question. I think anecdotally, COVID-19 with the children having to learn at home and not in a school setting, they've seen with certain um, special educational needs groups has actually been an improvement in learning because they've been able to pace their work, their time and fit it in around their kind of particular learning needs. And um, it takes a lot of the pressure off trained in a classroom. So actually, that's something that might be for um, is it um, kudos um, who asked the question to maybe have a look at what's been observed in the education sector and see where the opportunity is for digital tools and education to improve learning and assist learning as well in the home setting. But said so that's very anecdotal. Um, it's come from the UK um, sector, but it might be worth exploring. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add around that particular question. Any other Am I, if, I, if I may, I, I, I think if someone can find good solutions to this problem, it, won't, it won't just be a solution for Africa. I think it'll be a, a global solution because it, it's such a challenging problem. And e even not just in terms of special needs, just getting a five-year-old child to sit in front of a Zoom for five hours a day is not a possible task. And so we need to find alternate solutions that can use technology more creatively. And I think um, for everybody, it's that diversity in thinking is actually very, very powerful in teams and solutions. I mean, the, the um, advent of cybersecurity has shown how important it is for um, people on the, who have got that ability to concentrate and focus so intensely for long periods of times have been really adapted for that sector. So I would encourage people to look at it as well as an opportunity to bring in diversity into um, the workplace and to sort of educate people who can have a much more fulfilled role within the, in the workplace. Um, I can't see any more questions here, but I also note that we are actually up on time. So that was perfect way to finish. There are opportunities out there. And Sophie, I shall hand over to you. And thank you very much for the questions from the attendees and to the panelists. Thank you ever so much, Emma, and just to reiterate that thanks. Um, it's been very interesting to hear, hear your thoughts and hear the questions come in from the audience. Um, so thank you for taking the time to join today's session. Um, I'd just like to take a moment just to ha um, highlight some of the other um, events that are coming up this week and next week for the Global Ideas Exchange. Um, so at the same time, um, tomorrow through to Friday, um, we'll be holding similar sessions on open innovation, informal innovation, and multi-scale linkages, and have a um, series of wonderful speakers joining those sessions with us over the next few days. And then I also invite you to join the sessions next week. Um, we have a number of fireside chats, um, which I think will be of interest to 
the audience as they're focused on early stage investment and late stage investment um, in Kenya, Nigeria and South Africa. Um, so we're bringing together a number of um, investors into, into the room to have a discussion. And then finally, we'll be closing our series with the Global Ideas Exchange Summit on Thursday, the 29th of October, which I, we will reflect over on the sessions for, um, that have gone on for the last three weeks. And so I really do invite you to um, attend those sessions and the registration links, once again, can be found in the Zoom chat um, or the YouTube comments chat. Um, on a final point, um, as we said, this we hope this is a platform as well for knowledge sharing and networking. Um, so you will have seen that my colleague will have put a link to our Meet in Mojo um, platform um, and the registration link can be found in the chat box as well. So if you do want to organize any meetings um, with fellow participants or some of the panelists, please do go to Meet in Mojo and that will allow that to um, facilitate that for you. So once again, thank you ever so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you to the KTN team um, who have worked and our partners who've worked very hard to support and organize this event. And I will leave you with the video of um, for the series. Thank you again. <laughs>